Thank you, Lois, and thank you to the group, too, for leading us in our songs. Thank you. A mother wanted to teach her daughter a lesson about Christian giving. So she gave the young girl a ten-pence piece and a one-pound coin for the church. And she said to her daughter, put whichever one you want to in the collection plate and keep the other one for yourself. So, the next Sunday when they were coming out of church, the mother asked her daughter which amount she had given. Was it the ten pence piece or the pound? Well, said the little girl, I was going to give the pound. But just before the collection, the preacher said that God loves a cheerful giver. I knew I'd be a lot more cheerful if I gave the ten pence. <laughs> so that's what I did. <laughs> to the Jews, um, back in the time of Jesus and before, there were three great cardinal works of religious life. Almsgiving, which is the practice of giving money or food to poor people prayer and fasting. These were the three great pillars on which the good life, the righteous life, was based. And in fact, almsgiving stood first in the catalogue of good works. But Jesus speaks about these three things in uh, chapter 6 of Matthew's Gospel that we read, or Lois read to us just now. And he warns people about their motives when they give. He says, be careful how you practice your righteous acts in front of others, because it's not what you do, but why you do it that counts as far as God is concerned. It's your motivation, it's your heart's intent that God is really interested in. In those verses, Jesus talks about those who give in a hypocritical manner to the sound of a great trumpet, um, and I've been trying to find out a bit more about those trumpets, but apparently there is no good example in, in ancient times of people giving at the sound of the trumpet. It's thought that perhaps Jesus here is referring to the gifts given during special feast times, and not just on a, on a regular Sabbath, if you like. Um, because these feast times were actually signalled by the blast of the trumpet. And apparently, I'm told, in inverted commas, these occasions afforded golden opportunities for ostentation. One commentary suggests that Jesus was anticipating the thoughts of everybody there about, wouldn't it be impressive if I was like that? If people were to see how much money I was putting in. And, you know, sometimes it is very difficult to purge out those thoughts, isn't it? Not just of giving, but of other things that we do as well. Even when you're standing here, you think, what do, what do other people think? In a way, it really doesn't matter, does it? What other people think. And of the other gifts we have, of the group or the reading or the steward or anybody else that's taken part in this morning, they are the gifts the abilities that God has given us to use for his glory. In a way, it doesn't actually matter what other people think. And we're certainly not here to impress him by our giving, by our singing, by our reading, by our preaching, or by anything else. We are here to worship him. For we are all God's people by faith in Jesus Christ, if we believe in him as our Lord and Saviour. If we do these things, Jesus says, to be seen as righteous, generous, or religious people, then there may be a certain kind of reward, the admiration of other people. But really and truly, that is it. We've received our payment in full, says Jesus, because that is not an act that will receive any kind of commendation from God. God is not looking at what we do and how much we give, necessarily. He's looking at our motives behind it, in other words. Tithing in the Old Testament was alluded to um, week before last by Angela when she was here. Uh, but it's the practice of giving a tenth of our income to God. 
Now, one tends to think of that as simply being part of the Old Testament law that we read of, um, for instance, in Deuteronomy or Leviticus. But it was something that occurred way before that. And as Lois read to us just now from um, the book of Hebrews, um, it was something that occurred at the time of Abraham. Now, Abraham had just won a great battle against an alliance of kings who had taken Abraham's nephew Lot and his possessions into captivity. That included all the women that were with him and any other person that was associated with Lot. After defeating those kings, Abraham met Melchizedek, who was a great high priest, we are told. And Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of all of the spoils that he had taken from his victorious battle. If we read the account in um, Hebrews, we see there that by inference, the Lord Jesus should also be given a tenth because he is seen as a type of Melchizedek because Melchizedek, in effect, had no beginning or no end. He was called the king of peace, the king of Salem, the king of peace. And he is seen as a, um, a type, if you like, of Christ. Paul wrote to the Corinthians to encourage them to join other churches in giving. And uh, he says this, the point is this, the one who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Does that remind you of something? God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. Paul assumes regular proportionate giving, as we see in several of his letters, so that those who have can help those who do not have. When the New Testament writers talk about sharing or giving and making offerings, they're in the context of looking after people, of feeding the poor, of caring for the widow and the foreigner, and supporting their teachers and pastors. Now, the word church, of course, literally means assembly, or gathering, or congregation, because in the New Testament times, there were no actual church buildings, like the one we have here, or any other type for that matter. So there were no buildings to keep up together, which cost a fortune these days, or to keep warm, which is almost as expensive. Christians would have met instead in their local synagogues, or indeed in the temple in Jerusalem, or in people's homes. One would assume, however, that those who met in the synagogue or the temple would have contributed towards its work and upkeep. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and his companions were at Philippi, and we're told that on the Sabbath, they went out the side the city gate to the riverside where they were supposed, they were the, it says, and where there was supposed to be a place of prayer. And there was. And they joined the ladies there. And this is where Lydia, who was the seller of purple goods, uh, came to know Jesus Christ as her own Lord and Saviour and was baptised. Paul in the previous chapter of 2 Corinthians, makes it clear that the matter of Christian giving does not put Christians back under the law. We've seen already that through Melchizedek is something that happened prior to the law of Moses. He highlights how gracious God has been to us. He then shows that generous Christian giving is an act of love. Love for God, love for other needy human beings. It is a response to love, to all the loving and undeserved things that God has done for us. And so we're challenged to examine our giving, not in terms of whether we have obeyed the rules, i.e., you know, I must give 10% or I must give this or I must give that, 
but rather in terms of how much our giving reflects all that God has done for us and how much we want to thank and praise him for that. Our section, uh, sorry, our sermon this morning is in two sections, and I'm going to finish our first section there, but I'm going to finish with this verse before we, we sing a hymn. And in Matthew 6, the Lord says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that principle applies also to prayer. Some of you will have uh, been to Alpha over the years, and um, this book, Questions of Life, was written by Nicky Gumbel, who... Um, instigated Alpha in the first instance, or was part of that. And um, there's just a little section I'd like to read from this book, which is a follow-on to those who have become Christians as a result of the Alpha course. And he asks the question here, what is prayer? He says, prayer is the most important activity of our lives. It is the main way in which we develop a relationship with our Father in heaven. Jesus said. When you pray, Jesus said, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. That's back to Matthew chapter 6 again. It is a relationship rather than a ritual. It is not a torrent of mechanical and mindless words. Jesus said, do not keep on babbling like pagans. It is a conversation with our Father in heaven. A vertical conversation, not a horizontal one. A little boy once yelled, Please, God, bring me a big box of chocolates for my birthday. To which his mother answered, There's no need to shout, dear. God isn't deaf. Back came the reply, No, but Grandpa is, and he's in the next room. When we pray, it is not to others or to ourselves, but to God, just like our giving. So prayer is a matter of relationships, and when we pray, the whole Trinity is involved. In um, Genesis, we read that when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, they walked with God in the cool of the day. And they had a conversation with God. A conversation is a two-way thing, which Kathy mentioned just now. It was a close, intimate, personal relationship with God. That was the original plan that God had in mind. But of course, that was spoiled by the fall and has affected humankind's relationship with God ever since. There was nothing we could do to restore that relationship with God. But God, because of his infinite love, provided a way back, a way of reconciliation and restoration, of redemption through the cross. I'd just like to read briefly from Romans chapter 8, if I can find it. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons or children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery, to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, 
heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. Just think about that for a moment. And think of all that God has done for us. Let it fill your mind, your heart, your very being. We are adopted into his family by faith and by faith alone. He has made us joint heirs with his son, Jesus Christ. How fantastic is that? We are members of his family by faith through God's great grace. Our God is the God who says in Isaiah chapter 57, I am the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. As children of such a high and mighty God, you can talk to him as our heavenly father, the one who longs to walk and talk with us every day of life's journey. If we don't spend meaningful time with him, then it really is our loss, and I believe God's too. There is another side of prayer also that has been on my mind of late, especially with all that is going on in the world around us today, and that is the need for our own spiritual strength. In Ephesians chapter 6, a passage which I'm sure you all know well, talks about putting on the whole armour of God, so that we can stand against the schemes of evil forces in the spiritual realm. And having put on this armour, to pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Now there is much more that could be said about prayer. And in our hearts, I know we all know that we should pray and probably that we should pray more, spend more time praying, but it's up to us as individuals to do it, as individuals or as a triplet, or in any other means. But the important thing is to keep talking to Dad, Abba, Father, our Daddy, that's what it means. That is fantastic. He's ready to hear us anytime. Amen.